bicycle on the boy's birthday. It's just a rumor that was spread around town by the women and children. Soon we'll be shipbuilding. Well, I ask you, the boy said. They're going to take me to task. But I'll be back by Christmas. It's just a rumor that was spread around town. <laughs> I'm Cindy Bellin Berthesen. I am a producer. Um, I am also the founder and director of the Time and Children's Arts Initiative in New York. Hello, my name is Ewan Marcus Riley, otherwise known as Mark, and I am a designer, writer, and musician from London. Hello, my name's Eve Pomfret. I'm retired now, but I used to be school secretary and registrar at a girls' school in Notting Hill. Well, when you're very young, you don't, you're not aware that you're in the Cold War, or even, I was born at the end of the Second World War, and I played on bomb sites, so I didn't even realise when I was young what that meant. Well, I think you have to look at the whole social landscape of the time. It felt very, very, very scary. I mean, I was in kindergarten at that time, and it was just a half-day kindergarten. Um, we had these drills, and they went on through all of my el elementary school. So until I was about 11, no, 10, until I was about 10, um, we had these uh, basically bomb shelter drills. I, I played on bomb sites because they were a fun place. Other children were there. It's very dangerous, lots of dangerous things to play with, lots of rubbishy things and old prams left around. But I didn't equate it with the seriousness of what it involved. Everybody would have to go under their table and we'd have to hide our heads like this. And the, the thinking of this was that we were going to be shielding our eyes from the glass that would be shattering when we were bombed. Back in the 80s, we didn't just have the threat of nuclear war. We also had mass deindustrialization with over 3 million people being unemployed. Then there were the riots, from Belfast to Brixton. Folk were sick to the teeth of being treated like crap, or understandably doing something about it. Then to wrap it up further, we had the Falklands conflict, not to mention the National Front, the PLO, the ALF and the IRA, all using violence to make their point. It's worrying when your parents are worrying. I think that's, that's how I saw it. And everybody thought there could be a war. It's hard to understand what that means, even as an adult, I think, what, what it's going to mean to you. But it's a very sinking feeling to know that that's something that could be happening. But even if it were just like a regular bombing, um, it would be very bizarre that we would be able to like save our eyes, but not the rest of our bodies. The evening news was a montage of Soviet arms parades, uh, abandoned coal mines and factories, Vehicles being blown up in controlled explosions, crowds throwing petrol bombs, and in 1982 at least, uh, with images of horribly injured soldiers being stretched off the Sheffield and the Galahad. Um, there was no internet, no satellite TV, pubs still operated World War One licensing hours, and the threat of nuclear war was omnipresent. And and then during a certain period, the bomb shelter drills happened out in the halls of the schools. Um, so that we weren't around um, windows. Looking back, it was as if someone had taken a list of insane ideas for a dystopian movie and mixed them up in a huge bowl. There was an under underlying fear, I think, a worry. So it was really, it was extremely um, alienating. It was really alienating and weird. I guess you could say it was pretty bleak.
Yes, yes, because you're, if your parents are scared, then they're your rock. Um, more unnerving than scary, really. It was terrifying. It was really terrifying. You know, I mean, really terrifying. I knew that my husband would probably be too old to be called out and my son was too young. And that was a relief. But if you had um, young teenagers from 18 years upwards, they could be called up into the army immediately. And that's the biggest worry for a mother and a father as well, but particularly for mothers. When I was going on six, you know, I was really, really, really aware of it. Um because of the this constant thing that people are saying the red Chinese are going to bomb us so and and the fact that we were in these flight patterns where I was sure that all the things all these planes were bombers I don't think our children ever worried about it too much I, I didn't get the impression but I didn't ask them either perhaps I didn't want to know the answer or perhaps I just hoped everything would be all right. At school, we essentially had two types of teacher. The older ones who had been children during World War II, and which you could almost smell on them still, and the younger ones, who were probably only 10 years older than us, and all left-leaning, and largely seeing the evangelists. In their defence, I think they saw it as their duty to educate us about how horrific a nuclear strike would be. Um, so they made us wash threads. <laughs> which is a hyper-real depiction of a tactical nuclear strike on the city of Sheffield. Um, if memory serves, we watched it in two parts. The first part deals with the actual strike, with a really vivid depiction of the blast and the second, the aftermath in the following years, where society has regressed to something um, approaching Neolithic. Collecting this diminished first harvest is now literally a matter of life and death. I mean, to the point where children born after the strike communicate in this weird half-language, which is grunts, growls, and strange half words that they've cobbled together. I guess the point being because the infrastructure's completely collapsed, there's no one to teach them language. Yeah, pretty crazy. Um, now, I'll mix that into my first answer and think about that for a second. There's a lot of Soviet stuff. You know, there's a lot of communists. I mean, we're coming in the States, you know, not too far after, again, the McCarthy trials. There's a lot of still blacklisting, communist stuff, communist, communist, communist. Um, you know, that was the era that, I mean, 1960s when uh, Richard Nixon ran against um, JFK for president. So a lot of it was, there's a lot of fear mongering. Um, Eisenhower had just been president. So we're really, you know, we we're really in a post-World War II um, mindset. Then add to that, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher deliberately escalating tensions with the East and it genuinely felt like there was no tomorrow. Leaflets were posted through all the letterboxes down this, down this road. And that was horrible because it was telling you that if, if there was a, an explosion and you had to seal all the windows off, you obviously shut all the windows, and you had to seal them round the cracks with, with tape. Um, maybe it was a politics of fear. I mean, a scared population is easy to manipulate and corral in whichever direction you want. I mean, you just have to look at what happened during COVID to, you know, to see that first and in the last few years. You were instructed to have um, plastic bags. I can't remember whether they were supplied or not, but the idea was their body bags. So that when your children died, you put them in a bag and you put them outside somewhere. People think I'm going to put my children in a, a, a body bag and just throw them out. I know from having been in the Soviet Union during, a, during the period leading up to high glasnost that the amount of fear in the early part when I first got to the Soviet Union in um, 
when did I go first? 89, I think. Rocky, you're getting so much hair on me. Um, in 89, um, you know, there's still a lot of fear because of the whole history of Soviet repression. There were an awful lot of spy films around, a lot of things to do with Russia, uh, the Ipcris file, the, you know, the uh, John le Carre books that turned into films. People really enjoyed them. They really liked them, which is kind of ironic, really, because it's, they're based on something that potentially quite horrible and life-threatening. Uh, but people really relished seeing those. Maybe it's the edge of danger that they enjoyed. In 89, um, you know, there's still a lot of fear because of the whole history of Soviet repression. And people, for instance, I was living in a dormitory for foreigners. And when my Soviet friends came to visit, they had to give their passports. They, in, downstairs, they were... They were under surveillance. You know, when you came to visit or speak with a foreigner, then you were going to be followed by the KGB. People were always talking about spies and espionage and um, all the secrets that there seemed to be lots and lots of things going on that um, ordinary folk never found out about. You have a pair of psychopaths calling the shots and it created a very nihilistic mood. No, not really. Okay, so you don't have the same sense of existential dread we had back then, but there was a weird sense of safety which came from the East and West being locked in this constant binary detente. No, I think that's still the underlying worrying is still there. The 20th and 21st centuries are a disaster geopolitically. I mean, what's going on right now, being on the brink of World War III? I remember in my, my mother's day, the... Because the First World War was such a shock um, and so difficult, when you got after the First World War, all mothers everywhere kept a, a really well-stocked larder. They stocked lots of tins because they were always, having had that experience, were always expecting it could happen again. And it did. So as an adult, I experienced this completely differently, you know, from from the way I experienced it as a child. It feels more out of control now and worryingly unpredictable at times. The geopolitical landscape across the world is way more fragmented and subsequently more unstable. I think most adults um, realise that, but you can't spend your whole life worrying about it. Optimism is a fantastic thing to just hope. It, things will improve and get better. I think we've become, because of the amount of news that we have, I think we've become very jaded. And Rocky agrees. Mm. We've become very jaded. It's really hard to, um, you know, it's really hard to, to know. Ah, the future generations... Yes, I like a little bit more common sense. That would be good, and common sense would be good. Do not allow this shit to happen. <laughs> I mean, is that, are you allowed to say that in a yeah, documentary? Yeah. Do not allow this shit to happen. Do not allow yourself to become jaded. Do not accept this. You know, this is garbage. This is ridiculous. And I'd like um, them to listen to the historians who go back and see how things, mistakes, life keeps repeating itself. There is a pattern. There's a pattern there to look at. And there is knowledge within that history. I think there's a lot to be learned from our past. And I think historians hold the key. Yes. Don't trust any government. Ever. Like a child's attitude, it should be an adult's attitude sometimes. 
in that enjoy your life and don't worry about it too much. Worry about it when it comes. The nuclear war will be like, bye guys. And that's a wrap. <laughs> Gives way and suddenly it's day. <laughs> <laughs>